So, um, so I, I just start with a few background things, not um, really as important, but just a few historical things, you know, where do we fit Galatians in? So these dates are tentative, but if Paul's conversion, it depends on what dating you take, but Paul's conversion, whatever dating you take, mo most agree it's very, very soon after Jesus' resurrection, so 31, 32. I mean, on this day, Jesus was crucified and risen in 30, right? So most scholars agree Paul was converted very soon after um, Jesus was raised from the dead. We don't know. We don't know if Paul ever saw the historical Jesus. Maybe he did. There's, maybe he didn't, but that's speculative. Then in Galatians, this is somewhat interesting and important historically. Paul's first visit to Jerusalem after his conversion it, he speaks of that. We'll talk about that today in Galatians chapter 1, verse 18. And I would match that with the visit we read about in, in Acts chapter 9. Maybe, maybe we should just look at that really quickly. Um, I've got the Greek and English up, but we'll just read this in English on both sides. When he, Paul, arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples but they were all afraid of him since they did not believe he was a disciple. Barnabas, however, took him and brought him to the apostles and explained to them how Saul had seen the Lord on the road and that the Lord had talked to him and how in Damascus he had spoken boldly in the name of Jesus. Saul was coming and going with them in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He conversed and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him when the brothers found out, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So that, that visit, at least the way I'm reading it, is equivalent with this visit in Acts, I mean Galatians 1.18. Then after three years, I did go up to Jerusalem to get to know Cephas. So I'm dating that 33-34. Then after 14 years... Paul goes to Jerusalem again, and um, that visit I'm taking to be in Galatians 2. We'll read about that, so we won't spend time on it now. But this is when he and Barnabas go up to Jerusalem, and they take Titus with them. So that's, that's the date of that visit, and in and in Acts, that's Acts 11, and that is the famine relief visit where, where Paul and Barnabas go up to Jerusalem for the famine to bring funds for the famine that is striking the believers in Jerusalem. Then we see Paul evangelizing in South Galatia in 47 and 48, we presume, you know, around Tarsus, his hometown. And then in my reading, then this is debated. There are different views. I wasn't going to spend a lot of time on this. But um, I would argue that Paul wrote Galatians as his first letter. So I see it as very early, 48 AD, and that he wrote the letter before the Jerusalem Council. And that Jerusalem Council, I don't have it here, but the Jerusalem Council is Acts 15. And that's the council. Are you familiar with that account? That's the council where they um, determine whether the Gentile believers will uh, have to be circumcised to be saved. And, and they, they say no. So I'm arguing Galatians was written before that council. So th that's going to be very important, right? Because Galatians is all about whether circumcision is required for salvation. My argument is that issue had not been resolved yet by the wider church until Acts chapter 15. So here's another way of saying it, right? Paul's visits to Jerusalem, 
after his conversion, right? We have his conversion in Acts 9. Three years after his conversion, his first visit to Jerusalem with Barnabas. Fourteen years after conversion, Paul meets with the pillars. We'll talk about them, Peter, James, and John. Then you have that dispute in Antioch. Maybe, maybe that's Acts 15 even. And Paul writes Galatians and then the council. So that's just a little historical background. I don't know how much of that background you know. Um, I don't know if you have any questions about that. I don't usually spend a lot of time on that. But if you read commentaries and introductions, they'll spend a lot, maybe a lot of pages on this. So I did it really fast. I'm happy to answer any questions on that if you have any. So more, more, more directly related to what we're going to talk about, what's going on, what's the situation? Right? Every, when we read letters, every one of the letters, except for perhaps Ephesians, every one of the letters, Paul's addressing a specific situation in the life of the churches. Even Romans, I don't think, is a treatise where Paul writes out his whole theology. No, Paul's, Paul's letters are um, words on target addressing specific circumstances in the churches. And so we're, we're trying to discern the situation in the churches. And it's like listening, isn't it? Uh, many people have said this. It's like listening to one end of a telephone conversation, right? Because we hear Paul, what, what, were, the, what were the Galatians saying or hearing? And we have to kind of piece that together. And Galatians, I think, is one of the easier letters to do that because we're told quite a bit about what's going on. And the first thing we're told is the Galatians are departing from the gospel. And Paul, Paul tells us that, doesn't he? I am amazed that you are so quickly turning away from him who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. So what's the situation? They're, they're relatively new Christians, and they're starting to fall away. They're starting to defect. They're, they're starting to abandon the faith. So that's the situation, and Paul's, Paul's amazed by that. What's happening? Secondly, why? Why are they starting to defect? Why are they starting to fall away? Well, it, it, teachers, teachers came from outside and uh, influenced them. Maybe, maybe these teachers were from Jerusalem who uh, influenced them in this way. So there were outside teachers responsible for their defection. And where do we see that? He says, right, there are some who are troubling you. So, so notice this, right? He doesn't say, he doesn't say it's coming from within. Uh, the, 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 this sounds like people coming from outside, this, this language. There's some who are troubling you. And then it, we, we, it's a long ways down in the letter, but... In chapter 5, verse 7, he says, you are running well. We'll come back to this text. Who prevented you from being persuaded regarding the truth? This persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole batch of dough. I myself am persuaded in the Lord. You will not accept any other view. But whoever it is that is confusing you, Actually, that's, it's actually the same word, troubling you, will pay the penalty. So again, we see outsiders are troubling the church. And then we see it again in chapter 6, verse 12. Those who want to make a good impression 
oppression in the flesh are the ones who would compel you to be circumcised, but only to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even the circumcised don't keep the law themselves, and yet they want you to be circumcised in order to boast about your flesh. So we have these outsiders coming in, right? And uh, probably from Jerusalem, and they're, they've, they've disturbed the church, right? The church is confused now about what the right thing to do is. So they're starting to defect. They're defecting because of outsiders. Well, these outsiders are clearly, I think we'll see that, they're Jewish teachers. Often they're called in scholarship Judaizers. I mean, right, what are Judaizers? People who say you have to follow a Jewish way of life. So what, what do these people say? Now we're, now we're doing what is often called mirror reading, right? We're looking in the mirror of what Paul wrote and trying to figure out what the opponents were saying. And, and I think they were saying two main things. First, Paul, they questioned Paul's apostleship. They questioned Paul's legitimacy as a, an apostle. They said Paul was not a true apostle. So I think that's, you know, that's a helpful ministry thought, isn't it? Because if you thought, oh, well, Paul was persecuted by unbelievers, but all the believers loved him. No, not all the time, because even the Galatians began to doubt whether Paul was truly an apostle, even his own converts. So in the ministry, some of you are in the ministry, you'll be in the ministry, sometimes people in our own churches question us, right, for various reasons. I'm obviously, we're sinners, we're not perfect either, but here they, they're questioning Paul unfairly, right, in this case. So even the great apostle faced this kind of opposition. So the outsiders came in, and I think they said, Paul is not really an apostle. Now, why would they say that? So maybe that's a good question for me to ask you to think about for a moment. You guys are sitting at a table with each other, why don't you talk to each other for a minute and say, why, can you guess, think of, you've read Galatians, why would they question Paul in particular as an apostle? So do you want to talk about that for a minute or two? Yeah, okay, that's really good, right? He's not one of the 12, right? So yeah, that's, any, anything else you want to say? Yeah, I mean, that's totally right, yeah, good. Yeah, I think that's right, too, in the sense of, first of all, I think they said, hey, Paul, did Paul, the, the opponents came in and said, did Paul walk and talk with Jesus? No. No? Who is this guy? Was he one of the original apostles? No? In, do, you, can, do you want, anybody want to add to that in the, anything you said? Yeah, yeah, I think, and I think that's exactly right, and here's, Here's how I, I want to frame it, which I think fits exactly with what you said. I think the opponents said that Paul's gospel is not independent of Jerusalem, but he is making it independent, and that's wrong, right? Paul's not independent of Jerusalem, and, and so secondly... Uh, Paul is distorting what the 12 apostles or the apostles of Jerusalem, right? One of the apostles is already dead by now, James, right? Uh, has, has by, by AD 44 is dead. But he's distorting what the 12 apostles teach. So, 
so right, so that fits. He's not he's not following what they're teaching, so they're they're attacking they're attacking Paul. So we're going to see right chapters one and two. Paul's going to defend his apostleship. Before he can say anything, he has to defend himself. Really, I mean, he is saying things in those chapters as well, but he's mainly. Defending himself. Anything else you want to say that you brought up? Anything you want to add there? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And actually, that's my next point, right? That's very good. What, what, what did these false teachers say in contrast to Paul? One must observe the Old Testament law and especially circumcision in order to be saved. And that Paul denied. And, and right, we see this in the letter We'll come to it. And, uh, they probably, you know, were saying you have to keep the Old Test, the whole Old Testament law, because the food laws come up in chapter two. Remember when Peter's eating with the Gentiles, and then he quits doing it, and the Old Testament calendar. But that I mean, you know, feast days and Sabbath and um, you know new moons and all that, all those sort of things that the Jews observed. Now, let's hear what, what text, what verses did the, these Jewish teachers share with um, the Galatians? What did they say when they came to Galatia? And I don't know for sure, but I feel pretty sure they said, let's read Genesis 17. So I'm going to pretend I'm a Judaizer, okay? And I'm coming to Galatia, and I'm saying to them, did Paul read you this passage and explain it? So here we go. God also said to Abraham, as for you, you and your offspring after you. Do you notice that what God's saying here doesn't only relate to Abraham, but also to his offspring, to all his children. And how long should they do this? Throughout their generations. That means forever, right? You're to keep my covenant. Well, what is the covenant that they're to keep? This is my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you, not just me and you, but your children, which you're to keep. Every one of your males must be circumcised. So that's, this is what the false teachers said, I think, right? The Jewish teachers said, you must be circumcised. Maybe it's just spiritual circumcision. Maybe it's not physical. No, it's physical. You must circumcise the flesh of your foreskin. Can't be any clearer than that, right? That's physical. To serve as a sign of the covenant between me and you. Throughout your generations, how long should we do this? Forever. Should everyone do it? Every male? Yeah, every, this, is, this is a requirement for everyone. Every male among you is to be circumcised at eight days old. Or if they're born in your household or purchased from any foreigner and they're not your offspring, then, you know, whenever they come into the covenant, whether born in your household or purchased, he must be circumcised. My covenant will be marked in your flesh, so that's physical, right? As a permanent or everlasting covenant. Where did Paul get this idea that you don't have to do this anymore? What does the Bible say? The Bible says this is everlasting. The Bible says this is permanent. The Bible says this is physical. And, you know... You think for a minute and you think, well, that, that's a pretty good argument, isn't it? Because false teachers, right? False teachers aren't stupid. At least effective false teachers. They have verses, don't they? These guys have verses. If any male, this is how the sermon ended, right? If any male is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that man will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. He's cut off. You're not a Christian. You're cut off. You've broken the covenant unless 
you're physically circumcised. So I think that's what these people came in and said, these Jewish teachers, and they threw the Galatians into a tizzy. Oh, well, maybe you don't know that word. They threw the Galatians into confusion. So the Galatians were saying, what's, what's going on? That's a pretty good argument, isn't it? So they, 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 didn't, they, didn't, they didn't just come in and say, we like circumcision, you know? They came in and said, this is what the Bible says. This is what God says. This is what, this is what we're uh, supposed to do. So that's, that is quite, uh, quite, quite striking. Um, any comments on that? You, you want to say anything about that? Yeah, what does Paul mean by his authority as an apostle and is it equal to the 12? We will get to that in chapter 2. He will tell, that's a great question, but we'll, we'll get there. We're not, because we, he, he's going to, he'll tell us. So, yeah, that's great. So, so, so that's the situation, right? Paul's, Paul's in the, Paul is acting like he's independent of Jerusalem. He's not. Paul's distorting what the 12 apostles teach. The Bible clearly tells you you must be circumcised to be saved and to keep the Old Testament law. Paul didn't tell you that. Why didn't Paul tell them that according to these Jewish teachers? Maybe they said Paul wanted to make it easier for you. You know, he didn't want to burden you. Who wants to get circumcised, right? So maybe, maybe that's the reason he, he didn't say it. You know, I think I'm imagining here the Galatians might have said, but I, we thought we were Christians, and probably these Jewish teachers said, you're close, you're close, but you're not quite. Did you notice something about these Jewish teachers? They believe Jesus is the Messiah. They don't deny that. They say Jesus is the Messiah, he's risen from the dead. So they're, they're, not, they're not saying Jesus isn't the Messiah. No, 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 Jesus is the Messiah. He's risen from the dead but you've got to keep the law to be saved. That's what they're saying. So that's, that's interesting to note as well. Um, so that, that, that's our task. Our task is to see, we're doing that mirror reading, right, to see how Paul responds to this situation. So here's, here's my outline of the letter. I'll just... We have an introduction in the first two chapters. Desertion from Paul's gospel is desertion from the gospel. People have different outlines. I don't claim mine's the right outline. They're different ones. My second main point is Paul's gospel is descended, defended from experience in scripture. Third, a call to freedom from the law and freedom in the spirit. And then his final summary. So that's what we'll cover today. We talk about, in that first section, we have our greeting, those first five verses, and then the problem explained, or we could even call this section a rebuke, right? A rebuke in verses six through 10. And then the main thing, Paul's gospel is derived from God, not people. Remember, that's the main charge against them. The main charge is that his gospel really didn't come from God. So Paul goes into some detail, and we'll talk about the details later. So let's dive in, okay? We'll dive right into the text, and we'll see, we'll see about the greeting that... Greetings are typical in, in, in the letters, and so I guess you, you've all had some Greek, right? So we can talk about that some as we go as well. Um, so he, he begins, right, by identifying himself, the sender of the letter. That's how most letters begin, right? Who, who sent it? He identifies himself as Paul, but immediately... He identifies himself, right, as an apostle. Um, that is a uh, appositional relationship, if you know Greek, right? Paul, that is an apostle. 
And then he says, not from men, or not from people, neither through a man or through a person, right? So, here's, a, here's, a, here's something. When you read Paul's letters, how many letters did Paul write? Okay. 13, right? Very good. 13 letters. So he has 13 greetings. So one way you can study each of the letters is compare the 13 greetings to one another and see where things are different, right? So he always says his name. By the way, he doesn't always say he's an apostle. He usually does. But if you look at Philippians 1, Paul and Timothy, Dulois, slaves or servants, he doesn't always call himself an apostle, does he? By the way, I think there's a very intentional reason in Philippians he doesn't, uh, because they're struggling with unity in this church. But that's another issue. But here he says, not from men, neither through a man. Nowhere else does Paul say that in a greeting. Nowhere else. He never starts a letter like this. So he's immediately, we perceive, he's immediately right on the defensive, right? He, because isn't that what they're saying? This is what the Jewish opponents are saying. Paul's, Paul's, apostle is, uh, Paul's gospel is just a human gospel. Paul, Paul, Paul got his gospel from Jerusalem and he distorted it. Remember, he's dependent and he distorted it. So Paul immediately says, no, my gospel is not from men, nor th neither through a man. But it's, but it's through Jesus Christ and God the Father. So the very first verse, in a way that doesn't match really any other epistle, Paul emphasizes his authority as an apostle. And then he brings up the resurrection, who raised him from the dead. Now, that is very easy to skip over, but he doesn't usually say that in a greeting. He doesn't usually say in a greeting that God the Father raised Jesus from the dead. So, I want to suggest to you that in a way, all the problems Paul faces in this letter are solved with this one statement. He's actually v thinking very carefully about what he's writing because the resurrection I'm going to write this here. The resurrection means that the age to come has arrived in Jewish thought. The resurrection means the arrival of the age to come. And we see that, right, in the Old Testament. Like we see that in Daniel 12. Many who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to eternal life, and some to disgrace and eternal contempt. That's the resurrection. When the resurrection comes, the new age has arrived. The age to come has arrived. Well, we see it as well in Isaiah 25, 8. When God has swallowed up death once and for all, the Lord God will wipe away the tears from every face and remove his people's disgrace from the whole earth, for the Lord has spoken. Or you see it in Ezekiel 37. I forget the exact verse. Yeah, we can see it here. This is the passage about the dry bones. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the Lord God says, I am going to open your graves 
and bring you up from them, my people, and lead you into the land of Israel. So the resurrection means the age to come has arrived. The resurrection came in Jesus Christ. Okay, now I have another question for you. Jesus, Jesus raised from the dead uh, Jairus' daughter, right? The widow of Nain's son, Lazarus, presumably other people as well. Why? So I want you to be in your groups for a minute again. Why is that not the same as Jesus' resurrection? Right? Just for a minute. Why, is that, why, are those, why are those not the same as Jesus' resurrection? Does that make sense? Just talk about it for a second. That won't take long. Okay, what do we have to say? Share with us what you have to say. Anybody want to share? Yeah, it's the death of death. Good, good. Yeah, Jesus' resurrection gives life to others. The others did not. Very good. Yeah, yeah. Those are, all, those are all really excellent. Very, very good. Right, all those other people died again, didn't they? Yeah, I mean, they, they were, you know, we can't ask them, like, hey, you're going to have to die again. <laughs> so... Uh, they, some people write books about supposedly dying and coming back, but these people really did die once and then died a second time. So the, the, Jesus' the resurrection only began with Jesus. They were resuscitated is a good word. They were resuscitated. They died again. So here's, here's Paul's answer. Why isn't circumcision required anymore? Because, yes, Paul says, circumcision was required as long as the old age existed, but that age has ended. The new age has arrived. Now, there is an overlapping of the ages, isn't there? The new age and the old age overlap with each other. But once the new age has arrived, the day of resurrection, circumcision is not required. Now, he's going to say a lot more. But I think it's already here uh, in the very first verse. And I just want you to see, you probably already know this, Paul wrote this super carefully, didn't he? He didn't just dash this off. He... From the very beginning, he's thinking of his whole argument. Mo most agree he probably wrote several drafts of this and then sent it out. So this is, yeah, it's inspired, but it's also written very carefully by Paul. Okay, verse 2. Part of the greeting, and all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galatia. Now the recipients, the churches of Galatia, um, by the way, I take that to be South Galatia. I don't have a map here, but there's a South Galatia and North Galatia. There are big arguments about that. If it's North Galatia, the letter was written in the 50s sometime. But I accept the South Galatian view. The South Galatian churches are in Acts 13 and 14. Uh, they're, they're, that Paul and Barnabas evangelized them on the first missionary journey. So, that's not that important. Yeah. Well, you know, he does say from, from men neither through a man. And so he continues with that last through, right? So he starts with, you know, if you look at the Greek, the preposition apa, but then it's elided, but you have the preposition dia, and then he continues with the dia. Why, you know, why he, I don't know if there's great significance that he uses dia rather than apa, but he did just use dia, right? And he continues with that, because he does say, not from men, neither through a man. Um, so it's emphasizing agency, yeah. 
I mean, at least it, at least it emphasizes Jesus' equality with the Father, right? There, there, he's not at a lower level of any kind. Yeah, 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 good. Verse 2, and all the brothers with me. So, he doesn't usually say that. So, we're not going to do this all the time, and we got to sometimes go a little faster. But I just want to go to your groups one more time and say, why does he say all the brothers with me? Because he doesn't usually say that. Why do you think he says that? I, so, talk in your groups a second again. So, any thoughts on that? And yes, absolutely. That's it, right? He's saying, by the way, everybody, the Christians with me all agree with me. <laughs> You're the ones that are off track. All these brothers and sisters, I think it's probably sisters too, they agree, they agree with me. That you, you guys, uh, so you, you, do you think you're just attacking me? You're not. This, you're, you're wandering from the faith, right? So he's bringing in other people to say, I, this isn't really about me. This is about you at the end of the day. Uh, the Christian faith, Christ, this is what Christians believe. This is, a, this is a good lesson, right? Sometimes people get off in their individualistic way, maybe more in the United States, I don't know about here, uh, and they just have this idea that nobody's ever said before, and they get off in their own private interpretations. Well, you almost know for sure they're wrong, you know? To get off by themselves like that is, is dangerous. So, he, by the way, he writes to the churches of Galatia, there's, you know, Acts 13 and 14, churches established in Iconium, Derbe, Lystra, and Pisidian Antioch. So, several churches. Anything else you want to say about the first two verses? Okay. Very typical grace and peace to you, right? Very typical part of the greeting. But still significant, right? This is what Paul's gospel is all about. This is what Galatians is all about, God's grace, right? God's grace. What is grace? Grace is a gift, isn't it, uh, that God gives to his people. I think grace is also a power. It's a, it's a gift, but it also is a power that God gives us that strengthens us. Grace isn't just a present you unwrap, but it also is something that in, invades our lives and transforms us. So grace to you and peace, it's always that order, isn't it? First comes grace, then comes peace, right? He never reverses that. For Paul, God's powerful grace works in our lives to bring peace. And I, so I, I preached a sermon at our church last summer on peace, and I was just struck, because I looked up every use of peace in the Bible, and I was really struck in working on that sermon how, um, how important peace is in the Bible. That, and and God, God wants us to have peace. Uh, actually, I didn't share this verse in my sermon. I didn't have time to share everything. But here's a verse that's, I think, so interesting. May the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. Uh, and then the Lord be with all of you. And um, that's a good prayer for us to pray for uh, each other, isn't it? I mean, this is a prayer. So we're to pray this prayer. And do you pray that for your brothers and sisters? Do you pray that in your churches? May the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. What a wonderful, that's a benediction, isn't it? Um, and something we can pray for ourselves too, but pray for other uh, Christians, fellow believers. But that, that peace comes uh, from grace, from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, now here we have the from, right? Here we have the apa from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is called Lord. 
we could spend all day on that. We're not going to, but I'm, I do want to say that this is, this is a very strong verse on the equality of Jesus with the Father and that Jesus is fully divine. You never, ever read grace and peace to you from God our Father and Jesus and the archangel Michael, right? You never read that. You never read grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ and the Apostle Paul. No, grace and peace always and only come from God. So this, this is a very powerful verse on the deity, full deity, full divinity of Jesus. He, he is equal in essence and nature with God himself, isn't he? Um, because I've been working on Revelation, we won't talk about this, but I think it's really interesting because I've been thinking about this a lot. Grace and peace to you from the one who is, who was, and who is to come. I think that's the Father. And from the seven spirits before his throne, I think that's the Holy Spirit. There's not seven Holy Spirits, but the perfect spirit. And from Jesus Christ. Grace and peace only come from God. And there it's Trinitarian. Grace and peace from the Father, the Spirit, and the Son. Anything you want to say about that verse? You, typically, that's what he typically does, right? Typically, the Spirit... In fact, I, Paul never mentions the Spirit. In, in fact, Revelation is the only writer who mentions the Spirit. So, and I think the answer I would give is the Spirit, the Spirit's fundamental role is to bring glory to the Son and, and, and to the Father. The Spirit, I think it fits with biblical revelation in a way the Spirit is the shy member of the Trinity. So, I mean, it could be the other way, right? Because we see it in Revelation. But the focus is always, the, the Spirit shines a spotlight on Jesus' ministry and Jesus brings glory to the Father. So, yeah. Great question. So, he gave himself for our sins. Hey, so, I don't know where you are in Greek. Does any, can anybody parse that word, dantas? What does that come from? Anybody know? It comes from ditto me, right. Can anybody parse it? Do you parse? Yeah. <laughs> Anybody want to do that? Aorist, participle. Uh, yeah? Is it, what, what voice is it? Aorist, active. active, participle. Genitive, singular, we're missing one thing. Gender. Yeah. Masculine, because we're talking about Jesus, right? Participles have aorist, active, participle, masculine, singular, genitive, of ditto me, right? I give. So, you know, ditto me, just a little Greek lesson here. When ditto me goes down to the aorist, that the, the di of the stem drops off. And all you have left is do, but the, the omega goes to an omicron, right? It, it, so there it is. The stem is just that delta omicron. That new tau is the sign of the participle. That omicron sigma is the ending, right? The genitive singular ending. So all you have to show you what that verb is is that delta omicron, right? But it's a very common verb, did of me. So there it is. There's that participle. And actually, you guys haven't done that much syntax, right? Have you? But that is an attributive participle modifying Jesus as an adjective. Our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself, an attributive participle modifies the noun, right? So it's Jesus who gave himself for our sins. So there's a little, little Greek for you there. He gave himself for our sins. So we've had the resurrection, and now we have the cross, right? He doesn't use the word cross, but here we have the cross. He gave himself 
for our sins. And so a little preview of what's coming. I think Paul's arguing in this letter, the problem with you Galatians, when you get entranced to circumcision, you've actually forgotten about the death of Jesus. You've actually forgotten about the cross. You've, you've actually forgotten about the very heart and soul of our faith, the death and resurrection of, of the Messiah. So they've distracted you. And, I, and, 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 and you, you've been distracted from the very center of our faith. So that's the center of our faith too, isn't it? Jesus, Jesus' death for sinners. He gave himself for our sins, uh, on behalf of our sins. And we, so we're just going to notice in this letter how often Paul brings up the cross at crucial points in this letter. He gave himself hapos. By the way, anybody know what hapos is? Anybody want to say? It's a purpose word. It means in order that. He gave himself in order that he should deliver us or rescue us, it says over here. That word can mean deliver. Rescue us from the present evil age. And there's the, there's the age argument, right? Jesus is rescuing us. The cross and the resurrection mean the end for believers. Well, it's complicated because there's an already not yet, but we're no longer part of the old age in one sense. He's delivered us from that present evil age according to the will of God our Father. So, the problem is the Galatians are slipping back into the present evil age, aren't they? So, it's complicated. It's an already not yet, isn't it? It's complicated, and that's true for all of us. We're, we're delivered, and yet we can fall back, so to speak, in that, uh, to the old age, because their problem can be our problem, too. This isn't just about them, it's also about us, us. And then he says, to him be the glory forever and ever, amen. To whom is the glory here? Is it the Father or the Son? Jesus? There's a vote for Jesus? You think it's God the Father? Shall we fight? No fighting? You don't fight in the pastor's college? <laughs> so, <laughs> we have a vote for each. Anybody want to break the tie? What do you say? Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. I think it's the Father because, because right, if you look at the Greek, according to the will of God our Father, and then to whom? It, it's the nearest word. So I think he's talking about the Father here. To, to, to the Father be the glory forever. Amen. Now that doesn't mean Jesus isn't glorified too, but here the emphasis is on the Father. So the, the, the gospel brings glory to God. So there's, that's pretty much the heart of our faith, isn't it? The death and resurrection of Jesus by which sinners are rescued from their sins and given new life, that gives glory to God. Therefore, these Jewish teachers are just taking away from God's glory. So that's, that's terrible, isn't it? To take away from God's glory. 